All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Office Hours webinar. Uh, my name is Natalie Matthews, and I'm really excited to have you all here today for the um, Engaging Persons with Lived Experience of Homelessness in your COVID-19 response. We have a lot of really fantastic presenters and content to get to today. But before we do so, I want to just take a brief moment to have a couple of housekeeping reminders and um, give you all some information on how to engage with us today. So first and foremost, I uh, do just want to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and both a copy of the recording as well as the slide deck and the Q&A content will all be posted to the HUD Exchange. Um, please give us about two to three business days to get everything together and posted, but I promise you it will be there. Um, if you are having audio issues, obviously you're not hearing me right now, but hopefully you can see on the screen um, that we do have a phone number for you to use in case you need to join us again via your phone um, and are having any trouble connecting to the audio through your computer. If at any point you need that number again, just please send us a comment through the chat box and we will share it with you. Um, so in terms of connecting with us today through the chat features, Everyone uh, that is a, an attendee, we, everyone will be muted for the duration of our time together, but we do absolutely encourage a lot of discussion through the chat functionality. So all of you should see on your screen right now, it looks kind of uh, like a chat bubble. And if you click on that, uh, it's the icon that has the red square around it on your screen, that'll open up the chat box for you. And when you're sending a message, please, please be sure to send it to all participants. By submitting it to all participants, that's what lets it go to all the panelists uh, and our presenters, as well as all the attendees, and we love just being able to see the comments back and forth. If you don't see the all participants from your drop-down menu, then please go ahead and uh, click the arrow on your screen, and that will let you, it should let you easily select um, all participants. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Lisa Kaufman and Juanita Perry from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs to give us a formal welcome and get us going. Lisa and Juanita. Thank you, Natalie. Can, it, can everyone hear me? Yes, sound great. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Lisa Kaufman in HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. And like Natalie said, um, here is my colleague Juanita Perry, and then other members of the consumer engagement team as well. So we're really excited to have this conversation with you all today. Um, it was actually started a couple weeks ago. Many of you are familiar with the SNAPS office hours that we do every Friday for uh, the field. And during one of the office hours, we had presentations from the National Coalition for the Homeless and the Baltimore Lived experience advisory committee members. Um, and we realized from the conversations in the chat and the questions that there was a desire to have a longer conversation about how we engaging people with lived experience with homelessness right now during our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we wanted to extend an invitation to our panelists today. Um, and I'll let, uh, turn it over to Juanita and let her introduce um, uh, Sean, who will kick us off. I hope everyone can hear me today. Um, my name is Maria, and like I said, I'm um, co-lead for uh, our consumer engagement team in the SNAPS office. And um, I, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce you to Sean Jones. He is a member of the Baltimore Lived Experience Committee, and he is going to talk about what they have been doing in Baltimore. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Jones. I'm the chair of the Lived Experience Advisory Committee in Baltimore, Maryland. Good afternoon. I hope everyone's doing well. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you all hear me? Sean, you can be heard great. Thank you so much. Yes. Great. So the Lived Experience Advisory Committee is part of the local Baltimore City Continuum Care, a.k.a. Journey Home, uh, Baltimore. and I've been the chair of the committee for a little less than a year. Uh, Anthony Williams uh, founded the group about two, two and a half to three years ago. He may be on the call. I'm not sure if he's available at the moment. And uh, originally we were a work group of the committee. And then about mm, a year and a half ago, we were officially converted over to an extended committee. 
there's about 12 committees actually on the COC or Journey Home, and we're the most active committee, and we meet weekly, uh, literally, uh, whether it be by phone or by other means, <laughs> but normally it's face-to-face, -face, of course, when we're not in this particular COVID situation. So, next slide, please. So basically, our attitude as it relates to the response to COVID uh, and housing and homelessness is to make sure that our most vulnerable citizens in Baltimore City and truthfully right across the line on the county are pr protected and uh, safe and tested and all the things that would make an individual feel safe during this particular time. I think obviously, it's a very scary time, not only in our community, but, but worldwide. So what we've been doing is a variety of things to partnering and leveraging relationships with, with providers and the public health officials and public and private agencies, ultimately making sure that we have a voice on a various information, implementation on prevention and response strategies to support individuals experiencing homelessness in Baltimore City. Uh, next slide, please. So some of that includes, for instance, uh, emergency shelter assessment and testing, uh, assessment being focused on the COVID response, making sure the facilities that were uh, being utilized for shelters, most of which are closed right now, which I'll mention towards the end of our conversation, just, but just making sure that they're sanitized and they have the proper PPE and, and those that need to be tested or tested for COVID and so on. Uh, we work very closely with the local hospitals to make sure that their discharge practices are really in line to what the federal mandate is, but at the same time, that they're not just discharging someone that's positive or that has been exposed into general population, so to speak, you know, making sure that they're sent to an isolation site uh, or a quarantine site. So ultimately, one of the first things we did several weeks ago is expanded the overall capacity for social distancing in our shelters. There's four city-funded shelters here in Baltimore City, and there's several other public-private uh, scenarios as it relates to shelters, but I'm going to focus on the four city-funded shelters, which are tied to the funding that rolls down from HUD down to the local jurisdiction. Uh, so what we did is one of the main shelters, about 130 gentlemen, um, the Monument Street Men's Shelter, which has been around for quite a while, was, was the first to go, so to speak. Uh, we shut that one down and transferred all of the gentlemen that were in that shelter into a school that wasn't being utilized um, by the city. And it's very, very large, and it has the capacity right now, probably about 500 people. Uh, classrooms have been converted into um, bedrooms, so to speak. Large areas, gyms have been converted into sleeping quarters, you know, with some proper social distancing and so on in mind. Just basically utilizing every niche and nook and cranny of the space to make sure that we're A, uh, making sure that people are staying safe, B, that they have, you know, some level of uh, comfort, and C, doing whatever we need to do to support their needs as it, as it comes to health and wellness. Uh, we've also been focusing on in, in enhancing our outreach uh, to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, whether it be in an encampment scenario or just the street homeless in general or someone that maybe had a hiccup a couple of days before the um, shelter shut down. For instance, maybe they had a reserved bed and they lost that bed and they missed the opportunity to transition to the, the temporary uh, housing, I'll call it. Next slide, please. We've also been utilizing several area. Next slide, please. We've also been utilizing several uh, hotels in the region. It's about uh, one, two, well, I believe there's four or five in the county of Baltimore, which is roughly 20 minutes by car uh, from the city, and two or three in the city itself that have been used for a variety of uh, uses, ranging from quarantine sites to isolation sites to just, again, looking people that were not necessarily exposed early on, uh, but moving them into their own individual hotel rooms and so on. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to do in partnership with the local state, uh, city, and federal level is to really engage individuals experiencing homelessness at, at those levels. Why? Because we want to make sure that we, A, have a voice with the experts to help develop effective policy and strategies to prevent and end homelessness as a whole, because our attitude is homelessness should be truly rare and brief and really an emergency. In other words, maybe there's a foster care child that's, that's aging out and they become homeless. Maybe there's a runaway youth and they, they become homeless. Maybe there's an uh, individual that's suffering from domestic violence or some other violent uh, scenario or the, you know, the safe house scenario. Uh, but the bottom line is we really strongly feel that an emergency shelter should be just that, not a long-term stay, 
Uh, and unfortunately, due to the lack of housing stock and the lack of a lot of other things that happened in this particular market, um, there's many residents that, excuse me, fellow citizens that are homeless that became uh, a mainstay, if you will, of many of the shelters here. Um, we're working really hard on educating individuals experiencing homelessness and advocating at all levels, again, to um, really enhance the stimulus package and make sure that people are made aware of how they can actually access that, because some don't, don't really know. Uh, and lastly, really working with individuals experiencing homelessness to help them access technology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello, can you hear me? I, the, the slides have been moved. You're good. Yep. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up this call, this portion of the call, we really have been focusing a lot of effort on increasing what we're calling our text to give campaign, uh, specifically to raise awareness and, and, and funding for the lived experience of the community, but ultimately that funding goes right into the local journey home, AKA uh, COC, to really enhance our ability to, to impact more people. Uh, you'll see the last couple of slides will give some general contact information, what we're all about, what our focus is, but really we're proud to say that the lived experience advisory committee here in Baltimore City is making some um, pretty strategic moves and making a lot of noise with our voice. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, Sean, before we move on, we had one question for you. We had a question for you, if you can um, provide an answer for us real fast. Sure. Um, yeah, it asked, um, are your committee uh, members on the ground out actually doing the outreach? Are you more involved in the, the planning process or is it a combination of both? That's a great question. I'm sorry that I didn't clarify that earlier. It's a combination of both. When I mentioned outreach earlier, what we have, well, let me back up two steps. Our collaborative partner with the Baltimore City COC is the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services. So we work very closely with the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services in general through the COC, but more in particular, the Lived Experience Advisory Committee uh, meets with them, has a leader from the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services participate on our weekly Lived Experience Advisory Committee call. So yes, we're involved in planning, we're involved in advising, we're involved in approving and, and kind of aligning ourselves with being not only boots, boots on the ground, so to speak, but at the same time, if, if there's ever a need to supplement the actual outreach team from the city or from various agencies or providers, we do that. Uh, for instance, when we have the annual pit count here in Baltimore, we, we have all hands on deck for that from uh, the lived experience as well as other uh, committee members. But what we did recently through the COVID is because, again, two, two shelters shut down out of the four, one downsized, um, maybe a two thirds of the population was moved out and there's only women at that particular shelter now, whereas it used to be families as well as children. I mean, I'm sorry, children and families and a se separate section for men. So because of the reduction of staff needs, not only at the MOHS, but at these various shelters, we've been able to have the outreach team shift their priorities, if you will, and make sure they're doing, they're literally doing things from giving out various medication, methadone, or what have you, doing um, wellness checks. I mean, all the things you would imagine uh, an EMT might do or a doctor might do. Uh, so a lot of these folks are wearing multiple hats. Not us necessarily, but we gave some advice early on that, you know, maybe there's ways to take someone that's working full time for one particular agency and, uh, you know, get them deputized, if you will, for the health department. So they split their time doing health and wellness, but also outreach. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. We're going to go ahead now and turn it over to our colleagues from the National Coalition for the Homeless. We have Donald Whitehead and Kelvin Lassiter who will be talking next. Uh, so we're going to hold questions um, until after they present, and then we'll open it up for a larger conversation uh, from you all. So the chat is very dynamic, uh, and we'd love to see you all uh, posting in your resources and asking questions. But uh, we'll take the larger Q&As after Donald and Kelvin present. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Donald. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to say, uh, I've been looking at the, the chat box and, and what an incredible and diverse group of people that have joined the conversation. And I'm, I'm really happy to see that. Uh, 
And so I'll jump right in. The National Coalition for the Homeless is the oldest advocacy group that works exclusively with and on behalf of homeless people in America. And one thing I'll say about the National Coalition that makes me proud is that we not only engage homeless people, uh, homeless people are part of our leadership. Uh, as uh, as uh, an evidence of that is uh, I am formerly homeless and I'm also the president of the board of directors for the National Coalition for the Homeless. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, and this is just uh, some of the advocacy work we do. I just think it's a great picture, so I thought I'd include it in, in, in our PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Kelvin is actually on that picture. That's why I wanted to make sure we include it. But I also want to make sure you get um, our web address, www.nationalhomeless.org. Www uh, next slide, please. So talking about uh, how to communicate with homeless individuals during, during COVID-19, um, uh, one thing that I wanna say is that it's really, really important um, to uh, first of all, get the right communication out to people that are experiencing homelessness, uh, whether they be in shelter situations or some of the temporary uh, resources that have been provided but also even more importantly to outdoor encampments. Uh, so making sure that some of the direction that comes from uh, the CDC and also come, comes from some of the uh, other agencies that are providing it, uh, please get that information out about proper hand washing, uh, uh, proper hygiene, um, uh, making sure that people have water available and where those resources are available. So. Um, in, in communication is vitally important. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but there are a number of places right now that have um, uh, connections with people who aren't necessarily going to shelters or people who aren't in some of the uh, temporary resources that are available. Um, but the other thing I wanna say before I move to the next slide is that um, often when we face emergency situations, we find out uh, some of the gaps in our system. And it's my belief that communication with homeless people should not be completely difficult right now because it should be ongoing. Uh, we should always be communicating with people experiencing homelessness uh, because they can give us the answers that we need to move forward. And I wanna give a, thank, a thanks to HUD, Lisa Kaufman and Norm Shukar and Juanita Perry uh, for really kind of moving this issue of communicating with homeless people along I think we're probably at the best moment we've been uh, since I've been doing this work, and that's been over 25 years. So next slide, please. Um, so in, in addition to one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations, um, posting, informations at posting information at strategic sites uh, like soup kitchens and uh, other places that homeless people go to, uh, again, is really important. And um, uh, the other thing that's really important is to try to make sure that, especially at this time, uh, you get up-to-date information. What we found uh, years ago is that having phone numbers uh, for people, because a lot of people still have access to cell phones, is really important. So um, right now is a really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a time where we really have to make sure that all those people we're contacting on the street, uh, we have some form of communication. Sometimes it's email, sometimes it's phone. Uh, but communication is so very important. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, the information that needs to be uh, shared is some of the information that's being posted and make sure, of course, that that is able to be translated for our Latinx um, uh, people experiencing homelessness and, and also for uh, people who have limited uh, literacy um, ability. Uh, so please make sure that you're making this information accessible to, to everyone that's out there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, again, some of the information you wanna share uh, is to, uh, especially in encampments, uh, there's a camaraderie around people that are in outdoor encampments. So they tend to share things. Um, they tend to, to really be in close uh, situations. So please just remind people uh, in this time in, in, in our world, uh, sharing things could be a death sentence. Uh, so please uh, make sure that you're getting that information out to people. A lot of communities 
uh, are putting up temporary washing facilities. Um, one of the things I've noticed being on the street, because I'm actually uh, doing street outreach uh, every day right now, is that uh, bathrooms are really, really hard to come by. So I put together a list of places that will actually allow you to use a bathroom. Um, some of the normal places like 7-Eleven uh, gas stations are off limits right now. So it's really important to make sure that people uh, know where those places are. The other, things, the other thing I would say is that, especially for people in encampments, please make sure that if they start to get symptoms, that they immediately seek help. A lot of times, uh, guys that are weathering the storm out in uh, the world, um, they won't seek medical advice right away. So please make sure it's very, it's, it's so very important uh, that people are not left to fend for themselves once they start experiencing those symptoms. Uh, so please make sure people can get to uh, facilities to help. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, communicating with people um, right now, uh, one thing I want to stress is to normalize the process. Again, we should be communicating with people every day. This shouldn't be a special occasion. Um, so uh, one thing that we've really been able to capitalize on is uh, some of the temporary facilities like hotels. Um, in those hotels, uh, there's typically a phone in every room. Uh, many of the hotels have a, 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 a office um, uh, structure where people can use computers. And uh, so it's really important that we, we normalize that communication process and utilize uh, what I see as a very valuable time to be able to really talk to people. And um, also, um, I would say be creative. Um, homeless people are people just like everybody else. Uh, so um, it doesn't have to be something that um, is unnatural or something that you have to struggle to do. Uh, all the things that we do uh, with, our, with other people that we come in contact with, go to meetings, um, Google Meet, uh, uh, the other uh, office Zoom meetings, all of those kinds of meetings we can use with homeless people uh, that are in our, in our temporary facilities because they now have access to those things. Next slide, please. Um, Again, uh, I preempted this slide with, you know, use some of those unique settings that we have uh, that we're using. I know many of us, I myself, am really uh, at my limit for Zoom meetings and um, other kind of conference calls, but um, other people have never had that experience, and so it might be something exciting to them. But you can use those to have, because we do um, want to maintain safe distance and make sure that people are practicing um, all of the underlying things that will keep us safe in this crisis. And these are perfect examples of how you can do that. Next slide, please. Um, also, uh, utilize, uh, you heard from Baltimore um, and uh, their lived experience committee. Um, many communities have this kind of committee in, in their community peer support networks. Um, I say, um, right now is a great time to utilize those networks. Um, peer support uh, is phenomenal when it comes to helping homeless people. I hope that everybody who hasn't had the ability to put together a peer support network, um, get people who have gone through the experience of homelessness back involved in helping other people, uh, now is a great time to do that. So again, I encourage all of you uh, to look at this as both um, a situation that may be um, really, really um, a, a, a troubling situation, a very complicated situation, but it also has uh, some unique opportunities uh, to get people together, to communicate with people. So I hope people uh, that are listening today will utilize this time uh, to really get people involved. So next slide, please. Uh, and also, um, there are a lot of groups that are still doing the work in the community. Uh, there's a lot of church um, and faith-based organizations that are uh, still doing meals. Um, they're still doing uh, volunteer activities like passing out uh, hand sanitizer and other things. Uh, utilize those groups to, to disseminate the information. Um, again, it's really important to get that information out there um, because a lot of people um, are still very disconnected. Uh, so you utilize those community groups. Next slide, please. 
Um, and so uh, the other thing I'll say is that, again, th there are a lot of community spots. Um, if you did the pit count, I heard the pit count mentioned in the prior um, uh, session. Uh, so if you have designed uh, in your pit count hot spots where people are, please make sure you're visiting those. Um, I can't stress uh, any stronger the, the use of your outreach team. Uh, make sure, please, that they're protected, uh, that they're following safety guidelines, uh, but they know where people are. They have relationships. Uh, please utilize them, get them out on the street, and, and get the information to people. Um, again, community feeding locations, soup kitchens, uh, and then there's uh, other locations that people um, are allowed to utilize during this time. I know a couple of soup kitchens in my community are gathering places um, even uh, even though they're not serving at the same level, they still are allowing people to, to utilize their restrooms uh, and uh, communicate um, with each other. Uh, and so the next slide, please. And I think that um, that's it uh, for my presentation. But again, I can't stress more, uh, this, this COVID-19 experience offers us the opportunity uh, to communicate at a different level um, the other thing I want to say real quickly before I, I stop is that we also uh, want to utilize this time to make sure that people are getting into our coordinated entry systems. Uh, the last thing that I hope we do is that for us that have provided uh, the, the um, opportunity for people to be uh, in special locations, please, please uh, don't return those people to homelessness. Uh, so this is a very good time if you're doing document detective work, uh, if you're tracking down things, uh, utilize those hotel rooms. We have people that are in a, a stationary place, some that we haven't seen in a stationary place for a very long time. So I can't stress anymore, make sure people don't go back to homelessness. Uh, so thank you. That's fine. Thank you, Donald. Now we'll turn it over to Kelvin. Uh, and then we uh, we have a bunch of great questions in the chat box. Uh, so we'll take them after Kelvin presents. So Kelvin, we'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, can everyone hear me okay? I'm coming from, I'm coming to you from Washington DC, our nation's capital, uh, where we are in the same situation as a lot of other urban areas in the country. Uh, our mayor, uh, Muriel Bowser, extended our uh, lock in place to June 8th. So we will uh, hopefully act accordingly. And uh, nonetheless, our homeless citizens still need our attention. So Donald touched on quite a few things uh, as far as the physical aspect, which I had actually thought about myself. Uh, but there are a couple of things I will talk about on the uh, physical engagement with our unhoused citizens. Uh, one of the things I thought about was when you're engaging to, if possible, offer masks, gloves, and care packages. Those care packages can consist of toilet paper and soap because those are needed items when you're out in the elements. Uh, even if you're needed out in the elements, you still will need those items because uh, as, as you know, uh, being in the shelter, those are uh, come at a, a bare minimum. Uh, I myself, uh, as, as Donald was, uh, is formerly homeless. I uh, spent two and a half years on the street of Washington D.C. Uh, so I know a little. I know a little something about what it's like to struggle, and uh, hope my experiences can help other people who are still in the situation I left behind. Uh, the other thing I'm going to talk about, as far as your physical contact is if case managers are accessible, encourage the city, and Donald actually kind of talked about this, I still want to reemphasize it, install hand washing stations and portable bathrooms. I uh, took a tour of our one of our largest encampments here, uh, which is called the L Street Encampment, and there's only one porta potty to serve at least 100 citizens. Yes, you heard me correctly. I counted 63 three tents in between the two blocks, and you gotta assume there's at least one person, one or two people sleeping in each tent. So that's just, uh, that's not good. Uh, another thing, only engage law enforcement when necessary. 
Only engage law enforcement when necessary because it's a volatile situation when law enforcement comes on the scene. I don't know if you guys have had opportunity to uh, witness an encampment suite, but uh, it's not pretty. Uh, the lives of our unhoused citizens are disrupted and uh, uh, they're already going through a bad deal. And, you know, unfortunately, some people don't have compassion uh, when it comes to people who, who uh, is not as fortunate as others. So that leads me actually into my next uh, uh, part I want to talk about. And our mind is going to be a little more personable and not as sophisticated as my colleagues with the slides and stuff like that. But uh, nonetheless, I hope it still is helpful. I want to talk to you about engaging in conversation. Engaging in conversation. Showing an act of compassion is a great icebreaker. Please introduce yourself. That's very important. People want to know who you are. Why, why are you there? Show yourself friendly and dress the part. If you know you're going out in a, in a uh, trenches, there's no need to have a suit and tie and dress like you're going to the to the ball or anything like that. Nice polo shirts and jeans, nice sneakers. Be comfortable. Be comfortable because if you're comfortable, it makes a person who's on the street comfortable when you're engaged. In. Offer food, bottled water, feasible. Uh, those things are very, very important. It's nothing like being hungry and thirsty when you're out on the street. Talk about the work you were doing briefly and how you can have a positive outcome in, the, in their lives moving forward. If you were formerly homeless yourself, share that as well. People love it when you're personable. As Donald touched on earlier, uh, it's very important uh, to just have regular conversations. There's no need to be scared of them. Uh, some of the people, you'll be amazed at the backgrounds of some people who are on the street. And I'll just share this real quick. When I was staying in CCMV, which is the largest shop here in Washington, D.C., I saw this gentleman I knew, and I just couldn't place his face. And he looked really, really familiar, and he was talking to another gentleman. So as the two uh, disengaged and they were going in separate ways, the gentleman uh, said to the other one, well, Mr. Lee, it's been a great pleasure talking with you. Keep, uh, keep your head up. And a light bulb went off in my head. Wow, Mr. Lee. Guess who Mr. Lee was, y'all? He was my seventh grade math teacher. Seventh grade math teacher. So this can happen to anybody. And as, as you all know, 33 million people have claimed unemployment insurance, and some of those 33 million are going to be on the street as well, unfortunately. So let the person you're engaging, next point, let the person you're engaging lead the conversation. This will dictate your responses, and by all means, be honest. Don't say something you can't deliver. I talk to people all the time and says, well, my case manager says, I'm, I'm due to uh, I'm next up on the list to have housing. I should have it in a month, and I see them a month or two later. They're still on the same position. Be honest. That's very important. Conversation is going to be different. The next point: the conversation is going to be different at a uh, homeless encampment as it is to indoors. The stakes are going to be higher when the persons are, are outside. Nonetheless, the person may still experience criminalization. Now, I'm sure that you all are familiar with that term, criminalization, uh, doing this work. It's very prevalent. Even as we speak, people are still being criminalized on the streets. People are still having their stuff thrown away. People are still having their whole lives disrupted by law enforcement. It's very unfortunate. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're engaging them that you know, they may not be in such a place that appears to be friendly. Don't take it personal. Whatever you do is not personally directed towards you. Make sure you ask about their experiences uh, 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 before homelessness. Uh, people love to talk about themselves. That doesn't change with anybody. Uh, I know I love to talk about myself. I'm just going to be honest. You know, you know, when I was growing up, that was one of the things I got in trouble for in school, I just couldn't keep quiet. So that 
it's ironic that I'm using this now as a form to help people with this talk. <laughs> but yeah, just uh, engage the people and be willing to open up about your experience if you were homeless as well. Uh, last but not least, then th this is one of something my one, my colleague, uh, policy uh, person, Andy Liam Poor, I just want to give her a shout out, uh, who uh, he has helped me tremendously in doing this work. Uh, ask if there's a place for them to receive their mail. That's very important. When I was homeless, there was uh, two places I used to use. Uh, matter of fact, I just mentioned one of them, CCNV and uh, the Father McKenna Center. And so anybody on the line from D.C. would know those two places. And it's very important because if you are on the street, you can have your stuff thrown away, your medicine, your documentation, which is your livelihood. Uh, as a matter of fact, as we speak right now, the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless has pending litigation against the city uh, because five of our unhoused citizens had their medicine and documentation thrown away, including identification, social security, two of the things you need to exist in this country. Try getting anywhere without having a social security or identification. You'll see how uh, difficult it is. This also uh, prevents law enforcement from having the opportunity to throw the things away and not showing an act of compassion. This is a also, uh, this is also having uh, some place to get mail is also a great way to have the homeless register to vote. I cannot emphasize that uh, enough to incorporate that in your conversation because a lot of times when you're homeless, you get away from what's going on in society. There were days at a time I would stay on a park bench and eat my sandwich that I just got from the sandwich truck. And uh, this, this squirrel, this, this is a true story, had a squirrel, by the way. He would just jump up on a bench with me and just kind of look at me like, uh, you going to share that sandwich, Ben? And, you know, it's, it was, uh, because I used to say it at the same place every day uh, for like a month straight. And uh, you, you can lose who you are in the process. It's really easy to do because your only focus is how am I going to get out of this situation? And everything else really, I'm secondary, including family. Uh, one, you're ashamed if you're in that situation. You may feel shameful. So you try to distance yourself from society as well. So having a place to have their mail is important, not only to receive mail, but for voting purposes. And three, last but not least, uh, discuss how policy is shaped. Now, I know you may not have a lot of time and engagement, but discuss why policy is important. Uh, involve uh, the person you're talking to in the process, letting them know it's important for them to be involved. I do a lot of work uh, in research with the uh, consumer cares across the country, and I come to find out that on the application on a NOFA, they list that they are incorporating the homeless on their boards, anything like that. But when I talk to them and ask them that question, the answer is opposite. So get them involved. Get them involved. And tell them that one of the causes of homelessness as well is the federal minimum wage. The federal minimum wage has not been raised since 2009. It is still 725 an hour. That's a serious cause of homelessness in this country. You cannot work anywhere in the United States of America and survive off $7.25 per hour. Even if you work two jobs, it is impossible. Once you pay your rent and buy food, you may left you may be left to wonder, well, how am I gonna get back to work? I don't have transportation money. So there you have it. That's all I got, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I may have left out a few things, but uh, please feel free to leave some uh, questions in the chat box. I'm looking at the chat box as we speak. And if you can't uh, have the ability to type in the chat box, my email is klasseter, that's K, the initial K, L-A-S-S-I-T-E-R at nationalhomeless.org. And please visit our website, 
as well. We have some really cool things on there at www.nationalhomeless.org. I know that may be a shameless plug, but I'm not shameful and saying it. Thank you very much, and may heaven smile upon you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we have been blessed with an incredible panel today, so we are definitely going to leverage our time with them. Um, you all have had a bunch of great questions in the chat. So I want to turn this um, to, uh, I'll, I'll start with Sean. Um, Kelvin just talked about the importance of uh, engaging people with lived experience, right, like from um, policy perspective and making sure that, you know, their voices are at the forefront of, of all of this work that we're doing in the homeless sector. Kel Sean, can you talk a little bit about some strategies for providers, for COCs, for technical assistance providers that are on this call? What types of things should they be doing to, to bring in people with lived experience into this work? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Great, great. Uh, the bottom line is really, I mean, obviously we know the mandate as it relates to HUD requiring a minimum of one. I believe it may be changed to two now. I can't recall uh, the person with lived experience on the various um, COCs. However, what we felt like we needed to do is early on, many of us were sitting on the various councils or work groups or what have you at the, at the providers. You know, they had their, their uh, voice, if you will, at the consumer level at a you know, healthcare for the homeless, for instance, or our daily bread or Catholic charity. So that's kind of one way to get your foot in the door, if you will. And then really when we started forming the lived experience advisory work group that converted into the committee, it, early on, to be quite frank, it, it started with, hey, let's, we're gonna be meeting weekly at this set particular time every single week, rain, snow, or sleep, you know, the whole nine yards, and there's gonna be food there, you know, kind of having a carrot, if you will, to get people to really wanna be engaged, not only in the, Sean, are you still there? So Donald, I'll, Donald and Kelvin, I'll I'll turn to you while we're while we see if we can get Sean reconnected. Uh, anything that you wanted to add on to that? What would your advice be to folks who are? Oh, Sean, are you back? No. So yeah, Donald or Kelvin, if you want want to jump in with some strategies for for folks, you know, how do I start if I'm looking? If I'm a community, if I'm a provider, how do I even start? You know, what types of things do I need to think about? Uh, where should I go, you know, when I'm looking to, to bring in people with lived experience to, to do this work? So, um, so it's, it's, it's almost, um, for me, it's a little surreal to talk about it um, because every place that I've been uh, throughout my journey from homeless provider to uh, for a homeless person to homeless provider to advocate to consultant, wherever I've been, uh, I've always uh, had conversations with people. Um, in Cincinnati, uh, we started something called the Homeless Think Tank. And so what that was was a regular meeting of homeless people, and that group of people uh, looked at all of the proposals for uh, continuum of care funding before they got funded and rank those proposals. So we had it embedded in our system. Uh, there are so many other places. The National Coalition, one of the things that we've done since our uh, early existence was um, we had speakers bureaus. Uh, so we had people that went out and shared their experience uh, in the community. Uh, lately, we've, we've created a, a peer support curriculum uh, so that people can not only uh, be a part of the the um, uh, the the system. They can also um, help other people. So you know there there are so many nuances in the homeless provider system that people will only find out if they talk to somebody who's actually gone through the system. And they also can tell you what works in the system. Um, there's also uh, something that um, I was at the forefront of many years ago with my great friend Michael Stoops. Uh, the North American Street Newspaper Association. Uh, so there's street newspapers all around the country. And the last thing I would say is if you really want to get close to homeless people and have them as part of your 
um, continuum, have them as part of your community, hire them. So one of the things that people who have experienced homelessness make very uh, exceptional outreach workers. Uh, they make great case managers. Of course, um, there's other um, uh, things that are involved in, in getting to that process. Um, resident assistants, all kinds of different ways you can involve them in your community. There just has to be the will to do it. Um, but, but I would say uh, incorporate them at every level, including your leadership. So I know that's a long answer, but I uh, wanted to get all that. Yeah, I just piggyback on what Donald had to say. Hire uh, those with lived experience. And sec I second this point, you have to go out to where they are. They're not going to mm -hmm. come to you. As I just stated that, you know, I, I know I was shamed, you know, when I was sitting out there on those park benches and sleeping on park benches, and I didn't really want to engage anybody unless I had to. So you have to go to where they are and, and know that they have a voice. Uh, you can just Google some of the people today who are famous that were once homeless to go to show you that uh, it could happen to anybody. And just because you're homeless doesn't mean you're hopeful. If, if I could add, just I wanted to add two more things really quickly that I think are really incredibly important. Um, there's a lot of youth groups that have been formed, uh, YABS, uh, through, uh, you know, HUD's initiative. Um, I think some of the best uh, people uh, to help in your organization are some of the youth groups out there. I've met some amazing students uh, who have so much to add to the conversations. So that's a really good place to find. There's a lot of people that are on campuses across the country that are homeless. Uh, the other thing I would say is be creative. So over the course of my time, some of the things I've done is I've created softball teams and basketball teams and theater groups and poetry groups. Um, those are other ways to get people involved. You got to meet them where they're at. And so um, again, as, as Kelvin said, you got to meet them where they're at, whether that's a physical location or through the things that they care about. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. One of the questions that came in through the chat was about if there's any, if, if you all have had any experience with um, the challenges of um, sheltering in place. Have you, what are your thoughts on that in terms of interagency coordination and any thoughts on, on lessons learned? Um, is there anything that you know we, you want to share or can share for some of the participants on our calls right now. Sorry, what was it? What was the, the question? Was about what? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the whole thing. Yeah, no. So there was a. The comment was that one of the major ideas is to shelter in place to minimize uh, potential contagion, uh, but from a public health point, it has to be uh, difficult to do that. So if, if folks don't have the shelter, so uh, the the person asking the question just wanted to know from uh, a health and human services perspective, or do you have any experiences with any interagency coordination with working on this? Any thoughts on lessons learned? Sure, this is Sean. I'll be happy to jump in real quick. Uh, yeah, I was thank you, very, Sean. very actively involved with the mayor's office of homeless services as well as the individual shelters. Uh, I was actually staying in one of the shelters, uh, Weinberg, uh, waiting on my housing uh, scenario during the uh, shelter in place scenario, even though I was working, I wasn't really there that much. But the point is, uh, I was one of the last to go before, on the first wave, if you will, uh, roughly and maybe 100 people transitioned out, if you will, over a one week period to the hotels and what have you. That was the first wave. So the shelter in place scenario, to be quite frank, don't want to call out Weinberg by any means or any other shelter, but the challenge was this, because of the slow response I don't want to point fingers, but because of the slow response in the United States of America by the government to deal with this thing called COVID-19 and, you know, the PPE and all these safety protocols and, you know. Hello? Hello. Hello. Yeah, Michelle, we can hear you. Yeah, some, some advertisement just popped up. Hold on, please. Um, one of the biggest things that I saw was that so we said the slow response from the federal level all the way down. By the time it hit Baltimore City in particular, or the county, 
you know, there was no, there was limited PPE available, limited sanitizer, limited this, limited, I um, can't call what they're called, but the, uh, I call them a gun that point towards your ear <laughs> to check the temperature. Those tools that the providers and the individuals needed to be safe, man, it goes on and on and on, which I'm sure you experience nationwide. But we didn't have those things. You know, we had the sanitizer dispensers. We had brand new ones, but we didn't have the sanitizer to put in the dispensers, right? Um, they started in the areas where we would normally gather uh, for lunch or for dinner or for breakfast or they call it the day room or whatever. They limited the day room to, to non-residents, whereas the residents can stay shelter in place in the dorm versus having to leave at a certain time. But again, you know, if you have a bunk scenario, two maybe two or three bunks next to each other, yeah, they might be separated by six feet, but obviously you're not six feet necessarily from the person you're sleeping above or below. A, B, when they went, when we would go eat, uh, the only way you can access the kitchen, for instance, to eat or the dining area is if you get, get your temperature checked. They weren't issuing masks, and the only place it was the temperature check was taking place was if you entered the dining room. What if you work several hours a day like me, and you barely access the dining area, right? So finally, a couple of days a week, they would use the um, wand to check your uh, temperature if, as you enter the elevator or the stairwell or actually the dorm level that you were affiliated with, men, women, or convalescent. So my point is that those are some of the hiccups I saw along the way that even though they try their best as a provider – to, to follow SD protocol or PPE protocol. They didn't have enough tools in the toolkit. They, not to be funny, but they didn't have enough SD police, safety distancing police, so to speak, to help police, if you will, that whole concept behind social distancing. And again, how much can you do when, when the shelter is not designed in mind to have that kind of personal space? Uh, that's just one example. Uh, so I immediately contacted the, you know, our team at the mayor's office and our lived experience advisory committee and mandated that we figure out a way to deal with this. So one of the responses we had is one of our uh, fellow LEAC members, who also is affiliated with HUN, Housing on Neighbors, reached out to some volunteers, and they started making masks, custom-made masks, you know, and giving them out for free. Uh, you know, those are one of the ways we kind of combated not having masks available from other areas. And I'll be quiet at this point. I know we're running long. People feel free to reach out to me otherwise. Hope that answers your question. No, just thank you. Another question that came in, and this is for anyone on the panel, Donald, Kelvin, your work with the COCs. We had a question earlier about uh, compensating people for their time, paying people with lived experience uh, to come in and, and do this work, whether they're sitting on a, a COC board or another committee. Uh, can anyone talk about uh, some of the ways that you've seen that programs or providers are paying people with lived experience for their time, if there's a, you know, a, a structure or model that providers should be thinking about. I mean, we at least, I, I'm, I'm glad to, to see that the, the ground level is that people should, people should be getting paid for their time. Uh, so we know that, yes, pay people for their time. But can anyone talk a little bit more about how to structure that? Um, you know, in terms of anything that you all have seen in your work? So um, I can address it a little bit. Uh, again, hire them uh, at jobs that pay livable wages. That's, that's, that's one way to do it. But um, I know that um, oftentimes that isn't something that everybody can do. Uh, one of the things we did, again, in Cincinnati, also helped in D.C. to start theirs and Baltimore to start theirs as well, um, are street newspapers. Uh, someone else asked about getting people in articles and um, having other people uh, that can um, uh, do interviews. Uh, so the street newspapers are, um, I know street new newspaper vendors that make $300 a day, if you can believe that. Um, but um, I would also say look to the youth advocacy model because uh, a lot of the, 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 the kids or young people, uh, I, I shouldn't say kids, they get mad at me when I do that. A lot of people that are on YAB boards, uh, there's a stipend, a stipend structure that's set up. So when they're attending meetings, when they're part of uh, uh, organizing strategy, uh, they are able to get, um, uh, they're able to get stipends for that work. So um, that's a great way to do it. Um, uh, you have to find uh, a way to get uh, the funds to do that, and uh, 
Uh, I'm very happy. I added my email address there. I'm very happy to help people uh, with some of the ways that that uh, that you're able that you're able to do that. Uh, but but first and foremost, um, make people experiencing homelessness part of your workforce. Um, that's the best way to compensate them for what they give. Thank you. We had another question that I came just want in. to add. Oh, oh, go ahead, Kevin. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. So, uh, in addition to adding uh, to that piece that Donald just shared, if you incorporate people, it will increase their morale. They will feel like they're important. They'll feel like they're, they're part of society, which may compensate for the money that they're not getting. Yes, money is definitely important. It's like breathing. You have to, you have to do it. You have to have it. However, when you incorporate people in the CLC mix. They can go from feeling powerless to feeling powerful. And that's something money can't buy. Thank you. Thank you. I think we may have time for one more question. There was a question about uh, what were the key factors in helping you to create such a strong lived experience committee, Sean? If you could, uh, in about two minutes, uh, just give some food for thought for people. What are some of the things that they need to make sure that they have in place uh, to create a, a strong lived experience advisory committee? Well, maybe. Oh, Sean, I think you might be on mute. I'll turn to, to Donald and Kelvin. Any any insights for folks thinking about standing up a committee on their um, in their communities? Anything that you want to share with them before we uh, wrap up? Um, I, I think I think that all of we we've oh. um, I was going to say we 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 talked about quite a few things that can. Uh, be helpful in getting a strong committee formed, uh, compensa compensating them, and just wanted to add that you can use uh, COC planning funds to pay people. Uh, I didn't mention that, but somebody had that in the chat as well. But um, I think the, the other thing is you have to make sure that their time is value, valued and valuable uh, so that um, they can see the tangible results of their input. Uh, so, so actually utilizing uh, some of the um, suggestions, some of the things that they come up with um, is certainly a great way to do that. Um, but uh, Kelvin said it earlier, you got to get out on the street and you got to talk to people uh, or you got to go to the shelter and meet with them on a regular basis so you can really hear and understand where they're coming from. Uh, you got to go to schools, you got to go wherever you can or wherever people congregate and make sure that you're listening because uh, listening is so important. Uh, and if you listen enough, um, you can recruit some really great people. And if you actually use their input and show them that they're valued, uh, then that's the best way to create a committee in my mind. And the model, the model, the financial model that we use is uh, we follow what the states, uh, excuse me, the cities, urban cities are doing, like San Francisco and Seattle and D.C. Uh, as a $15 an hour uh, model, or if it's a whole hour where uh, you can just pay $50. You know, I think somebody receiving 50 bucks for an hour's time, uh, they would be happy walking away with that. I just want to put that out there as well. Definitely not 725, whatever you do. All right. Well, I just want to thank our panel today, Kelvin Lasseter and Donald Whitehead, Sean Jones. Um, you all have been uh, incredible presenters. We so appreciate uh, the work that you all are doing um, in working with uh, people who are currently experiencing homelessness, people are, are engaging these systems. We appreciate your advocacy and always pushing the field to make sure that we're lifting up uh, 
people who are the most important part of our work um, in leveraging their expertise. So on behalf of Juanita and the team in the SNAPS office, we definitely want to thank you all for your time today. Thanks to Natalie and Tommy Joe and Jean and all the folks uh, who set up this call on the back end, all the technical work. And then lastly, um, thanks to all of you who, who devoted an hour of your day. We know that you all on the front lines are doing incredible work in responding to this pandemic and making sure that people who are experiencing homelessness are not at risk uh, for infection. So we put, take our hats off to you. Thank you all for all that you're doing. And please continue to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. We want to learn from you. And if you have ideas for additional topics that we should cover, please send them our way. Um, thanks to all of us that folks who worked on this call, and everyone have a great day, great afternoon. And like Natalie said, these slides will be posted eventually, uh, so go to the HUD Exchange and you'll be able to uh, have these slides as a resource and hear from our knowledgeable panelists anytime you choose. So thank you so much and have a good afternoon.